my daddy was there. Sermons, the best of them move you. They can move your head to think, they can trigger your heart for a response, but the best of them will allow the Holy Spirit, allow you to move your flesh out of the way, to let the Holy Spirit to move you like nothing else. It can be delivered stoically with a monotonic manner, i.e. a priest, or with fire and brimstone, like a Pentecostal preacher getting you to jump off the pulpit. Some make one point emphatically, others are layered and have multiple messages. But this one, this is a journey over several weeks, okay? I'm going to lay out quite a bit of information. We're going to go on a journey through black history. I'm going to discuss the beginning, God in the beginning as I am, to Ham, to Instagram. We're going to discuss Black History Month, what it is, why it is. We'll pivot to history. The history of the world is outlined in the Bible. And we'll lay that over a quick iteration of African ancient history and the spread of Christianity then narrate the export of African people across the world and how, though treated as chattel or livestock, Africans around the world embraced the message of the gospel and have always played a significant role in the church and all aspects of life. Ready? Well, this first week, I want to call it my daddy was there. Say it with me. My daddy was there. My daddy was there. Now, this pertains to you. This pertains to you regardless of where you're from, whether you're black, white, purple, yet brown, yellow, orange, green, whatever. But why? Why do we celebrate Black History Month each February? So, let's see. Black History Month had its genesis seated in Chicago back in 1915. Okay, Carter G. Woodson, a Harvard grad, traveled from Washington, D.C. to Chicago, where he was also an alum to participate in the national celebration of the 50th anniversary of the abolition of slavery. And this was sponsored by the state of Illinois where they had exhibits. Exhibits at the Coliseum, which is the same place where they had held the Republican National Convention just a couple of years earlier. So no small venue. And at any juncture, there were six to 12,000 people waiting to get in to see these different exhibits that basically looked at the progress that African Americans had made during those 50 years. You gotta remember the reconstruction happened during that time. This was no small venue, but there was great demand. And this inspired Carter G. Woodson. It inspired him to form an organization to promote the scientific study of black life. And along with the prominent minister, Jesse E. Moreland, they founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, an organization dedicated to the research and promoting achievements by black Americans and other people of African descent. The group sponsored a national week called National Negro Week from starting in 1926. It was the second week in February, which corresponded with Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln's birthdays. Now, this week inspired schools and communities throughout the country to, to do the same, to have a National Negro Week. And they hosted you know, lectures and performances. My daddy was there. In the decades that follow, mayors, cities, and uh, around the country began having these yearly proclamations recognizing the Negro History Week. And by the late 1960s, thanks in part to civil rights movements, as well as a growing awareness of black identity, Negro History Week had evolved into Black History Month on many college campuses. So in 1976, some 60 years after that 1950 convention, the first celebration of an association used its influence to institutionalize this celebration. President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month in 1976, calling upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every endeavor throughout our history. And since that time, every American president, Democrat and Republican, has issued proclamations, great and minuscule, endorsing the association's annual theme from Ford to Trump, now Biden. And this year's theme is diversity. So some ask, why? Why black history? And I can tell you as a black male that spent much of my primary schooling in primarily white schools, if my father and mother weren't adamant about me learning our history, I would have thought that Martin Luther King was the second coming of Jesus and Malcolm X was a demon. And that Africans' contribution to American history was limited to slavery, sports, and entertainment. But while Black History Month has been criticized by both blacks as well as people of other races, 
towards unfairness and devoting an uh, entire month to a single people who are let who so to a single people. There are lessons to be learned uh, about from Black history by everybody, especially as it relates to our faith in God. And during this celebratory month, there's an opportunity to reflect on the rich contributions of African descendants to history. And remember the price paid by others for all of us to have the privileges that we have today. We will get to see how my daddy has been there all along the way. In Deuteronomy 4, 8 through 9, Moses preaches a long sermon before he dies that emphasizes history. He told the people to remember, to teach their children, otherwise they will forget. In chapter 6, verse 7, he goes a step further. He tells them to diligently teach their children. That word diligent means to show persistence and hard work in doing something. In other words, Moses was telling people to, to make their children, make teaching their children everything about God and what he'd done for them a priority. He told them to talk about what God had done and his laws. And when they sat down in their homes, when they went outside to play, when they went for walks, when they went to bed and when they got up, the image that he was trying to paint was they should they should always persistently be teaching their children and their children's children about God and everything he had done for them. They were always to be talking about it. Finally, he also told them that they should write it. They should write about God and their door friends and on the gates. Literally, this was to ensure the words were forever before their eyes. Hey, you know, a lot of us have crosses and sayings on the doors of our house even to today. In other words, Moses was constantly telling his people to tell the children about how their daddy was there, how God was there at the beginning, how God has been there in the middle to give them assurance that he will be there as time passes until the end. So by teaching about black history, it should not be this gloss regurgitation of the minimal that we all know. Black folks were enslaved Bought to this country, many were murdered, they were free. Rosa Parks sat in the front of a bus, Martin Luther King made a speech, and Barack Obama became president. Yes, yes, that is all important. But this does a huge disservice to the edict of Moses to teach the children about God and everything he has done for them. So let's take a step back. What do we mean by black? I don't have the time nor the desire to argue anthropology with folks. But I can't say this definitively. Africa is over 11.6 million square miles. It has as far, it's as far north from one end to the is, is south from Boston to Buenos Aires, Argentina. That's, that's pretty far. It contains many shades of people, hair types, eye colors, body makeup, sizes, heights, and so forth. The tallest people in the world, the Watutsis, i.e. Manu Ball, who's over seven foot, but yet the midget in his family. It contains the world's shortest people, pygmies, whose average male height is no more than five feet, like five one maybe. They're the blue black people of Sudan. They're, and, and, and the Nubians. You have the chocolate brown complected folks of West Africa. You have the pecan colored of Ethiopia. So when you're talking about black, we're talking about any of these variations, any of those colors and body sizes. In these countries, we have had, in this country, we've had the one drop rule, but you know, when it, for this, for this purpose, for the purposes of this message and the following weeks, yeah, we're celebrating black as the derivative of African men and women without any quantification. So follow me. In the beginning, 3761 BC, according to Jewish tradition, the day Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, between 3740 BC and 2500 BC, we have Cain and Abel and Seth being born to their parents, Adam and Eve. My dad was there. I think we all know these Bible stories. We know Cain slew Abel and was exiled. He wandered off to East to Eastern Nod, and we move forward in time where there was a flood. The flood destroyed Edom and all the ancient ones. And then there were eight people. There was Noah, Mrs. Noah, and their three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, and their wives. The eight of them repopulated the world after the flood. All of the earth population came from Noah and his three sons. And it's generally accepted of those sons, Ham is the father of the black race. Okay. Now, if Ham is a father of black race, we're doing sort of a reverse genealogy here, not starting with ourselves as normally is the case and going backwards. We're starting with him and coming forward. So with him, with Ham, 
as a father of the black race, we have to be conscious of something. The Bible does not deal with people by race, okay? It doesn't say this person was black or white or whatever color or Asian. It talks about family lineage. It talks about the places people lived. So we need to know the families and we need to know where they lived, their habitations. Now, these are Ham's four sons, as indicated in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, state these specifically. Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Now, Mizraim settled in Egypt. Cush settled in what's known today as Sudan or Ethiopia. Put settled in what's known as Libya. And Canaan settled the land of Palestine, the land of, as we know today, as Israel. Yes, that's the same Canaan that the Israelis, Israelites thought of as the land of milk and honey, the home of Jerusalem, the home of Jesus. So at these early stages in history, Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, Canaan will be identified as black. Specific people who are identified as such include Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10, verse 9, who was a mighty warrior. My daddy was there. The Canaanites were descendants of Ham. Genesis 10, 8 through 20 mentions the Philistines, the Amorites, the Hittites as descendants of Cush, Egypt, and Canaan. So now around 2100 BC, Abraham left Ur and he moved north to Haran and went into Canaan, then to Egypt, then went back to Canaan. So make no mistake. Not every person in the Bible was black. I am not here to say that. But we cannot tell world history without, without black history, without taking dedicated time for this. Many of us would go on thinking that Moses looked like Charlton Heston, Brad Pitt, or Chris Hemsworth, and Jesus looked like a hippie, and that there are no Asians, and that the black folks were all slaves. But the Bible tells us otherwise. Think about it. When does the Bible take place? We live with this presumption that the Bible's players were all white men because of the famous portrait by Da Vinci of the Last Supper. Also because of our nurtured tendency to immediately credit all great history to Europeans. However, a quick glance at a map lined up next to the Bible tells us a different tale. The Bible is a multicultural book. One of the effects of racism is the whitewashing, chauvinistic view of history. And sadly, this has taken place even in our biblical studies. The outset of human history is captured in the Bible. It envelops the south of Spain to current day Iraq, Ethiopia to the Black Sea in the north, to the Middle East, Southern Europe, Northern Africa. From these countries, you have all races represented and participating in the story of God's creation, relationship, judgment, and salvation of mankind. It is difficult, potentially, to see the black presence in the Bible because you won't read the terms black or African, but you will read the terms Ethiopians, Cushites, Egyptians, Hebrews, or other tribal terms. Ethiopia is mentioned 45 times in the Bible, and to this number add Egypt, and you put those together, Africa is mentioned more than any other landmass in the Bible. It should also be noted that the Middle East, yeah, the Middle East, including the Holy Land, was connected to Africa until 1859, when the Suez Canal was completed and had been referred to as Northeastern Africa for the majority of modern history. People should know that Blacks have always played a role in God's plan for humanity and were not an afterthought, subject to desires of governments or captors or labor needs. Specific to this discussion, we look to the participation of black people as we celebrate black history. Hagar, the Egyptian concubine of Abraham, may well have derived her ancestry from South Egypt. And she alone of all biblical characters gives God a name. Genesis 16, 13. Like Abraham, she meets God in the form of an angel and is given a promise that her progeny, yeah, her progeny are going to become a great nation. Genesis 21, 18. Moses' Cushite wife, Zipporah, aroused the bitter jealousy of his sister Miriam, Numbers 12, 11 through 16. And amusingly, Miriam resents his, her black sister-in-law and she becomes white with leprosy until she mends her ways. If his Cushite wife was Zipporah, then Moses' father-in-law, Jephro, the priest, who instituted the judicial, administrative, and sacrificial patterns of Israel, 
he and his family had received, Jethro and his family received the Moses in exile, where Moses was a shepherd for 40 years in Sinai. Zipporah understood their importance of circumcision and performed the rituals of their, for, on their sons, Exodus chapter 18. Moses looked to his father-in-law for guidance and direction. And they were Midianites who were Cushites. When Israelites settled in the land of Canaan, there were Africans among them. Some may have left Egypt along with the Israelites at the time of Exodus. Others came with military invaders. We can look at 1 Kings chapter 14, 25 through 18. We look at 2 Chronicles chapter 12, chapter 14. Apparently an Ethiopian colony was also created at Gerar as a buffer between Egypt and Judah. Thus the Ethiopians became permanent residents in Palestine, remaining there until the time of Hezekiah, around BC 700. Persons of African descent appear to have taken an active role in Israel's social and political life. The bride of the song of, in the Song of Solomon was black and beautiful. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5. A Cushite who possessed tact, discretion, and a high position in a royal court appeared to be a trusted courtier sent to tell David news of Absalom's death. 2 Samuel 18, 19 to 32. Africans continued to enjoy royal favor as Solomon married an Egyptian princess. 2 Kings chapter 9, 2 Chronicles, and received the Queen of Sheba, 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles. The Queen of Sheba was influential. She ruled dark-skinned folks on both sides of the Red Sea, and she may well have initiated, initially come to Solomon to negotiate a, a treaty of some sort of trade because of their growing maritime power. And she may have initially questioned him with some hard questions, but it appears, as Solomon wrote, that they became kindred spirits, able to have free discourse with one another, sharing equal minds, which is a large statement coming from Solomon. When Cushite powers ruled over Egypt, they contracted military alliances with both Israel and Judah, especially during the time of the 25th or the Cushite dynasty. Sabacho, 716, was, was, as he was called, was, was, a, was a ruler. He made alliances with Assyria, uh, Hosea, and the list goes on and on. You've got Cushite pharaohs with with monuments that stand to this day like Tarhaka, Tar, Tarhaka whose African features are in this enormous tower that still stands above